Who likes breaking things? Like, yeah. Who breaks it? It's not my yeah. It's on purpose. Don't recommend breaking bones. Frown upon structural integrity in a human body. Like, ow. Yeah, got them all yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, also, you guys are in the business, we're going to hopefully be in the business of building things for people. Um, so you guys are, some of you working on like uh, 3D printed hands, um, some structural analysis for robots, um, but at the end of the day, like, you could maybe end up working on bridges or cars or automobiles or buses or planes, um, and things go wrong. So, a little bit of failure here. We're going to skip through some of this because it's really slow. It's really close to where I live. Oh, do I see this? No, this is the Oh. Oh, this one. Is the bridge supposed to do that? No. Yeah. Yeah? I mean, only for well, fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's true. That's not a good point. That's how I mean, why is video like? Because it's from like the 60s. I know so. 30s. Yeah, imagine being on that bridge at that point. So I don't know about you guys, that's but like, metal should not be moving in that direction. <laughs> Ever. Like, I never want to be on a bridge and see that happening. That's a little bit of the, like, funhouse maze extravaganza to a whole new level. Um, so this is really one of the most pinnacle engineering failures of our times. Um, this was, you know, modern building materials, mo quote, modern science. Um, and we ended up with this. Luckily, nobody was killed in this. Um, they were able to, like, evacuate the bridges. Um, and get everybody off. So that's like the nice part of this. How do they evacuate the problems? Like, how how do they evacuate by the bridges like spraying like that? So it didn't it didn't fail immediately, right? You see this all like quaking and moving, um, but you could still like walk along the center line here. Um, so you you'd be able to get out of your car and like run away. So that's like a great a great study of what happens. Um, when we as engineers don't fully understand our systems. So that's, you, this is a textbook ex case study of engineering failure. Do you, do you know why this happened? Yes, but that's uh, beyond the scope. We're not going to get into that's that. That's beyond the scope. <laughs> Can we think well, that why, we're not it's not scope. actually the explanation that people do. What? Like the... Wind, yeah, wind was hitting the harmonic frequency. Yeah, that's not actually. So oh. we're talking about engineering failures today. Um, we're going to kind of touch on some of the big ones. <coughs> Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, some of the big ones, uh, like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge failure, um, which is huge structural and could have actually put many, many lives at risk. Um, and we're also going to talk about innovation going wrong. Um, so maybe less so to put the lives at risk, but more of the capital and the investment. Anybody ever read about the Hyatt Regency, uh, Kansas City, that uh, just collapsed? Bueller? Maybe? Uh, we learned a little bit about this in my mechanical engineering class. Yeah, so it's, it is your classic mechanical engineering case study for statics. Um, so there was a bridgeway that was supposed to hold about 100 people, and that was you know max load. They put 120 people on there and had a structural member that had been changed mid-design and mid-construction uh, that could only hold about 40 people. And so similar to the Tacoma Narrows, people were jumping up and down at a dance party and this entire thing collapsed. Sadly, unlike the Tacoma Narrows, you can see the destruction um, and you can imagine if people were on there when it collapsed, bad things would happen. So this is really, engineering gone wrong, horribly wrong, because lives were lost, right? An engineer made a design, an engineer changed the design, and didn't do the analysis to verify the quality and the structural rigidity of that, um, and people died. So that's like kind of the really sour side of engineering is, what we do as engineers could impact people's lives. For good, certainly, you know, that's a lot of people aspire to that, uh, but you do something wrong, and it can go very wrong. Uh, this is kind of another one, Tacoma Narrows, engineering failure. This was uh, in 1942, uh, up in northern US, the USS Schenectady. Um, I believe it's that, that's how it's pronounced, Schenectady? So. Yep, oh, it's a strange, strange spell word, uh, but we'll go with that. And uh, so the water was lukewarm, the air was frigid cold, 
Who's ever poured boiling water into like a mason jar? <laughs> yeah. Who's ever left uh, like a beaker on a Bunsen burner too long? What happens? Shatters. Yeah. What happened here? Literally the exact same thing, except it was a multi-million dollar ship and not like a seven dollar beaker. Um, so when they were working with the structural steel, they didn't account for rapid temperature changes in media such as water and air. And so when there was a huge temperature difference between the air and the water, uh, this, this happened. Uh, so in this instance, sailors did not die, but there were a couple other instances of sister ships to this uh, in which they were sailing across the North Atlantic Sea and the entire ship literally cracked in half and sunk. So that's again like modern engineering at the time. Engineering beyond what we know, uh, beyond our modeling capabilities in which people's lives were lost. How old were you guys in 2007? Seven. 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 Five. Okay. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, really young. Wow. So the resolution doesn't get any better if we go full, full screen. So. Where were you when this happened? We're in Park, Colorado. You remember stuff like this. <laughs> Sorry. entirely different yeah. discussion um, but here this this gets into the ethical realms of engineering of are we advancing too far for our safety precautions um, organizations like NASA and SpaceX really push the envelope uh, SpaceX even more so because they're not a government institution um, but as you move forward in your engineering careers take the time to read about these failures um, these ethical dilemmas that we as engineers have uh, and understand where you are putting your line uh, you know, are you are you comfortable building weapons, or would you rather build healthcare systems? Where does your comfort lie as an engineer when it comes to understanding the value of the human life? So, on a bit of a lighter note, uh, I'm going to talk about some different kinds of failures. These were failures in innovation. Um, these were engineers that had radical ideas uh, that thought they could do something big and thought they could be successful and it didn't work out. Um, so this is a, a Formula One car from 1972. If you're not familiar with Formula One, um, it's a type of racing where they're constantly pushing the boundaries of cars, uh, trying to make the cars better and better and faster and, and uh, trying to throw big engineering ideas at the cars um, in order to be more competitive. Uh, the problem here was in 1972, they had rules that said that the front wing of the car could only be a certain size. Um, you couldn't make the, wing, the wing bigger. Uh, and as you can see here, the front wheels were very big and they would stick out beyond the wing. Um, that was bad because at high speeds, uh, there's a lot of aerodynamic drag from the wheels. Um, so someone had the idea of making the wheels smaller so that they would fit behind the wing. But then because they're smaller, you have less grip. So to compensate for that, twice as many wheels. The wheels are half the size, they both fit behind the wing. There's less drag, but the same amount of grip. Sounds like a great idea. Who thinks it'll work? Show of hands. Good intuition. It didn't work. <laughs> it wasn't fast. Ah. Ah. This was more recent. Uh, this picture is from around 2013, 2014. Uh, an Audi uh, Le Mans prototype car. Um, these types of cars have been the same for a very long time. The driver's in the front, the engine's behind the driver, rear wheel drive. Someone at Nissan had the idea to switch it up, put the driver at the back, the engine in the front, front wheel drive. Didn't work, wasn't fast. The problem with this one, uh, you had too much weight over the front of the car, the front brakes couldn't handle all that when you tried to slow down from high speeds. So it was fast, just didn't slow down? 
Uh, it was fast for about a lap, but the brakes couldn't dissipate the heat fast enough to keep up with that. Uh, the car was unbalanced and it never worked. Similar idea, this is an LMP2 car. Uh, these are what the cars have looked like for a very long time. Someone had the idea, let's make it smaller. Half the aerodynamic drag, half the weight, half the power. Should be just as fast. That doesn't look aerodynamic. It wasn't just as fast. It didn't. That doesn't look aerodynamic. It is, it was very aerodynamic. It had less drag. It weighed a lot less than this car. Um, they tried to make it more efficient by putting a smaller engine in it. Uh, it was much more efficient, um, but the math just didn't work out. It just wasn't as fast as those types of cars. It was cheaper to run, it was better to, for the environment, but in a racing environment, it just didn't work out. So this leads us into the question of uh, what were the upsides and the downsides of these types of failures? Failures of, uh, this is one very specific context of motor racing, where we tried big ideas that we thought would make big strides and they just didn't work out. The downsides are pretty obvious. They poured millions of dollars into each of these cars. Nissan spent a lot, a lot of money trying to develop these, paying engineers to design them, paying drivers to, to drive them, um, testing them. They poured millions and millions of dollars into them. And it, they just didn't work out. And those millions of dollars, you can't get those back because the project failed. But on the upside, no one died. None of these cars crashed. None of them exploded when they tried to go around the track. So it wasn't a tragic failure like the examples that Eric showed. They lost a lot of money, but they learned a lot. They were able to take some things that they learned here and bring them back to those types of cars and make smaller improvements on that type um, from what they learned by this radical show. And so that leads into our segue of when is failure good, when is it bad, and how can you tell the difference? How can you tell when you're designing something? Can this afford to fail? What will happen if this fails? Um, and, and will I be okay with that, or will that be a national strategy? Um, so who has some ideas? When, what can make a failure okay or not okay? Um, what type of stuff? A failure is not allowable when lives are at stake. Absolutely, that's a huge one. Um, when these cars failed, they were just slow. They didn't crash, no one died, no, no life was at stake. When a space shuttle explodes, or a ship sinks, or a hotel collapses, or a bridge breaks, that's very bad. People can die. And that is absolutely a, a big consideration. Um, you have to understand what's on the line um, and, and what's relying on the success of your son. Um, generally, ethically, it's not okay to put human life on the line. Um, you have to test stuff and, and be very sure that something's going to work um, before you let a human uh, put their life. Any other ideas? What can be a sign of a, a bad failure or a good failure? Barth? A failure would be like bad when you only have like one shot at it. Absolutely. Um, we had a guest speaker, John, who was talking about his startup with the satellites. Uh, they put all of their investment money into one satellite that was launching off one rocket. That was their only shot. If that launched and it exploded right after it left the ground, the company's dead. They don't have any more money. No one's going to invest them again because they had one shot and they blew it. But if you're the Air Force or, or NASA and you have trillions of dollars to, to pour into this, you can try and launch something that maybe blows up, but you have another shot. You can try again. Um, NASA just has billions. Huh? NASA just has billions as the annual factors, not trillions. Just <laughs> <laughs> the, the Air Force has more money than a start. So you have to consider uh, financial costs of failure too. Can you quite literally afford to fail? If you fail, will you have another shot? Or is that it? Are you done on that failure? Any other ideas, Richard? A failure is good if they can like implement what they learned into another um, trial. Absolutely. Um, some of these failures they learn from and were able to improve the next generation or even the past generation, they were able to, to bring what they learned back. Um, a failure is bad when you have no idea why it failed. Um, that can be something when you're testing. Uh, it's important when something fails to understand why. So if you launch a rocket into space and you say, yeah, this all looks like it should work, we think it's going to work, but we're not going to attach any sensors or any communication or anything to it, we're just going to launch it, it goes up in the air and blows up and you have no idea why. How can you try again? 
because you don't know what failed that time, how can you know what to improve? If you have a million sensors on the thing and it's constantly sending information back to Earth, you send it up and it explodes, but then you can look back at the data that you were collecting and say, oh, this was a gasket that failed, or uh, this part got too hot and it broke, and that's why, uh, that's why this failed. That's much better, because you can take that information, you can learn from it, there's some value to the failure. Um, there's tons of quotes about uh, failure is just an opportunity to learn or, or a way to improve, stuff like that. That's true, but only in certain circumstances. If something fails catastrophically and you have no idea why, sometimes you can't learn anything. Um, so before testing something, that can be an important consideration is, if this fails, will I know why and will I be able to, to grow from that? Any other ideas? What about your guys' projects? What happens if, if you fail a blue stamp? Right. I mean, at least, I guess something I've learned is it's a lot better to fail at like software elements than hardware elements because sure. when you fail with the software, you just go back and you look at it. But like, sure. with my project, when I put like a bad type of glue on my mirror and it showed through, then I had to order a whole new part and it's no going back. Absolutely. You have Command Z and your Arduino ID. You don't have that loop. You can't just take it off. Um, Justin? Um, uh, uh, failing can be like sometimes better, even more valuable than success if like if you got a success just by luck and you you can't spot the uh, uh, the error. Again. Sometimes if you get get like uh, if you if you got a failure then. Uh, it, could, uh, it will give you an opportunity to fix it uh, uh, before before maybe you implement the entire circuit and fix it or something. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you're testing just one component, um, testing independently of the rest of the system, you can throw a bunch of different things at it and, and try and make it fail and say, uh, how robust is this? Um, what will it take to break this? Uh, and then fix that before you put it in the full design. Uh, what about timing? Does that have anything to do with it? If you fit, if you uh, blow up one of your, your circuit boards in week two, is that different than blowing it up in week five? Yeah. Why? I saw a lot of heads nodding, which means you all agree, but why? So what do we have to think of time as? A resource. It's a resource. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's what this all comes back to is resources, which ones are expendable, which ones do we have excess of. Um, at Blue Step, no one's really working with parts that are that expensive. So if you break a part, we can afford to buy a new one. We have enough of that resource. Time is a more limited resource here. We only have six weeks. We're, we're in week five now. Um, we're starting to get to the point that if you fail now and you have to wait two or three days for a part to get here, that's happened to some of you, that can be a big setback. Whereas in week two, you had other stuff that you could do. Now, in week five, time is very limited. That's a resource that we don't have a lot of. Um, even the Eric's examples, uh, human life is a very, very valuable resource. Um, we don't have a lot of astronauts. We can't afford to blow up astronauts. That's not okay. Um, all of these things are resources, and you got to look at how much of this do we have, how much can we afford to lose, um, and what are the risks associated with one of them. Any other questions, comments, concerns, ideas, examples? Chris? So, talking about resources, there's another resource that's a little more uh, ephemeral, and that is like political capital. So if you think about NASA, Absolutely. NASA's budget is controlled by Congress. Absolutely. And some Congresses like NASA, some Congresses aren't such a big fan of NASA. And you know, in the 60s, NASA could basically just have unlimited money, they could do no wrong, and could do whatever they wanted, and it was just like, gung-ho, let's go for this. Like now, NASA has to be a lot more careful, and they have to make sure that the people who control their revenue stream are happy with what they're doing when a lot of our Congress people don't actually know anything about engineering or science to sure. a terrifying extent. Yeah, and a lot of them may not understand that failure in some circumstances is okay. They see something and they don't understand how much NASA learned from that failure. They just see, oh, you did a bad thing, no more money for you. 
Yep. So, and that's one place where, like, you know, we make you guys do this public speaking, we make you guys do documentation, we make you guys work on writing. All those communication skills that are kind of a pain sometimes. Like, when you're trying to convince somebody to give you money for the cool engineering thing you want to build, come in handy. Okay. Um, the people that have the money in Silicon Valley, the venture capitalists, not a lot of them studied engineering. Not a lot of them know a lot about it, so it's important that you can uh, communicate your ideas to them clearly um, because they're the ones that are going to be funding your project and at some point you're going to fail, you're going to need more money, you're going to have to explain to them this is why I failed, this is what we learned, this is how we're going to improve um, and sometimes it might be difficult to, to convince them to uh, continue funding. Um, I guess it's not on in line with that. That's right. Um, so I want to talk about my experience in my education. Um, I use something that's kind of like an Arduino. It's a development board for creating electronics like this, but it costs $400 instead of $20. And so the first time we started using this, I went up to my teacher and it's like, am I liable for this? If I break it, do I owe you guys money? Because $400, that's a lot of money. Um, and so what he said to me, he was like, if you write a bad piece of code and fry something, or I connect something wrong and I fry something, they'll give me a new one, no problem, I don't owe any money. If I drop it on the ground and it breaks, or I pour, like, spill coffee all over it, that's not okay, I do owe them $400 for that. Um, so do you guys kind of see what's the fundamental difference between those two cases? Um, does anyone have an idea? One of them's a failure and the other one's kind of just like an accident. Um, yes, uh, but I guess what I was getting at is, I guess, Kevin, do you want to crack? Oh. Like, you don't learn anything from, like, spilling coffee on it, but then you learn, like, not to, um, like, wire it incorrectly if you do fry your board or whatever that way. Exactly, spot on. So, the first situation, oh, yes, Justin? Wait, wait, uh, no. Wait, I'm confused. If you, if you spill a coffee on your, like, uh, on your circuit or something, won't you learn to like be more careful? <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, yes. There is learning there. The learning is don't have open drinks around electronics when you're working with things. So yes, there is learning there. But the key difference is when I'm writing code or wiring things up, that is part of my education. And they don't want to penalize me for trying to learn new things and for experimenting. Me spilling coffee on my development board is just me being irresponsible. Um, so that's like the big difference, uh, where one is part of my education, spilling coffee, you definitely learn, you don't make that mistake again, but that has nothing to do with my education, and, um, Your yeah. class is about microcontrollers. Exactly. I'm not even supposed to have drinks in lab, but... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, we're just about out of time, uh, any last thoughts, final comment?